Wisdom, according to the Word of God, is the principal thing. That's the basic text for this series. Wisdom is the principal thing. Not faith, not grace, not love, not any of the other important subjects that we often emphasize. Wisdom is the principal thing. And I think you can begin seeing that as you understand how wisdom is defined, how the Bible uses the word and what the definition scripturally of wisdom actually is. I've said in times past, wisdom is the ability to make knowledge produce the desired result. We can have knowledge of a lot of different things, but it doesn't really produce any kind of increase or result in our life that we'd like to have. There's natural wisdom and there's spiritual wisdom. Of course, natural wisdom, you may have knowledge of, uh, you know, automotive design or aviation, airplane travel, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, but it's not just knowing about it. It's knowing how to make that work in your life for you in line with the will that God has for you. And there's spiritual wisdom as well as natural. You have knowledge of the Word, that's spiritual. That's a source of spiritual wisdom for us. And the Word will tell us that by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. You need to know that. You need to know that uh, He wishes above all things that thou mayest prosper as well as be in health. You may have knowledge of the promises of God, but it's quite a different thing to know how to make that word produce results in your life. I know too many Christians who believe that healing is part of their covenant. They have that knowledge. But months, years often have passed and healing hasn't happened for them. They believe that God cares about their financial lives as well. It's His desire that you have all sufficiency in all things, but they never seem to be able to make ends meet. And so wisdom is the ability to take knowledge and make it produce the desired result. Knowledge in and of itself won't change your quality of life or your usability in the hands of God. Wisdom will. The ability to make knowledge produce the desired result. The last time I preached on this, I shared Dake's uh, definition of wisdom, which I like a lot. In his definition, he says that wisdom is the ability to discern the best ends for your life and the best means to attain those ends. That is Dake's way of saying what I just said. Wisdom is the ability to make knowledge produce the desired result. <clears throat> and so when we begin discussing our access to wisdom, we need to remind ourselves, first of all, that 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, Christ is made unto us wisdom. He is made unto us wisdom. But obviously that doesn't mean uh, just because somebody's born again, they're going to operate in the wisdom of God. It's available to you through Christ's finished work. In Christ, you have access to, to a wisdom that will change and transform your experience of life. But access is the key word. You have to learn how to access the wisdom that is available to you in Christ. We spent some time saying, uh, talking about a couple of sermons ago in this series, that the Holy Spirit, often referred to as the spirit of wisdom, or is referred to as such, we see that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you yield to that indwelling presence and you pray in the Spirit, and that would be tongues. We're told in, in <clears throat> chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians <clears throat> that you're praying the wisdom of God in a mystery. You're speaking to God mysteries. And we see in chapter 2, it's the wisdom of God that you're speaking in a mystery. And then so we put that together with Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 
which says that when you pray in the Spirit or in tongues, the Holy Spirit is making intercession for you according to the will of God. <clears throat> uses the word saint there. You may not feel too saintly, but that's the way God refers to believers. And he says the Spirit is making intercession for the saints according to the perfect will of God. So oftentimes when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, it's the Spirit praying through you about God's will, God's plan for your life. Those are the best ends. Part of wisdom is discerning the best ends for your life. So we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, and I'm not taking time to turn there because I've already preached this message once, but it says in that verse that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He's praying through us, not with words that man's wisdom teacheth, but which He teaches, the Holy Ghost teaches. This is what tongues is. And he says you can believe to interpret what is being prayed through you by the Holy Spirit and gain insight into the Lord's ends for your life. That's the subject of this passage. <clears throat> In verse 9, he said, I hadn't seen, ear hadn't heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. He has a wonderful plan for you. Those are the ends that wisdom will reveal to you. And so learning that you can access that wisdom as the Spirit of God is praying through you with groanings which cannot be intelligibly uttered, making intercession for you according to the will of God, you believe for interpretation and you'll start gaining insight into the ends, the will God has for you. And that's the first part of wisdom. Secondly, we saw that wisdom is something that should be asked for in faith on certain occasions and regarding certain things. And of course, we get this from James chapter 1, verse 5. But it's preceded by three other verses which say that we're to count it all joy when we fall into divers, temptations, tests, and trials. Count it all joy when adversity comes, because that's what the Greek word means, a putting to proof by the experience of adversity. So it's counterintuitive to rejoice when adversity comes. Keep reading. You have to know this. It says knowing this, that this is about the trying of your faith. Adversity coming to you is the enemy of your soul putting pressure on what you believe. Adversity coming to you isn't coming by the hand of God to teach you a lesson, to chasten you, or any of the religious reasons we hear people spout. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians, I mean, uh, verse 13 of the first chapter of James, we see we're not even to say that adversity comes from God. Temptations, tests, or trials don't come from God. We know who the tempter is. It's the enemy of your soul. And he understands this. He can't change your destiny in the Lord unless he can change what you believe. Jesus said that. He said, your life will be unto you according to your faith. Your faith is a reference to the investment of your belief system in the Word of God. And Satan knows unless he can change what you're believing about the Word of God, he won't be able to affect your destiny in God. So he brings circumstance that is counter or contrary to the promise of God you're believing. You've decided to believe that you're healed. Well, you get this doctor's report that says things are looking pretty bad. You decide to believe that the tithe God will respond by opening the windows of heaven and you can become a sower and that he'll multiply the seed sown, but you, you don't have enough money as it is. It doesn't seem that you can meet your family's needs as it is. Satan works to generate circumstance that opposes what the Word says about you, endeavoring to put enough pressure on your faith to get you to change. 
He wants you to come to a place where you say, well, I've been believing for healing for, uh, for months. It hasn't happened. Or I've been tithing for the last year. No windows of heaven have opened in my life. He can do that for a season. That's all he can alter circumstance to counter what the Word has told you and what you've decided to believe. He can't hold that indefinitely if you stand on your faith. If you continue not to get weary and well-doing, then that's just going to be a season that has to end and you will reap your harvest. But he can prolong that time if he hears you saying things like, I don't know how long I can handle this. Or, I don't know if this is the word or not. Maybe, maybe this word doesn't work like this or maybe it doesn't work at all. As long as he hears what you're speaking and it indicates to him that you're weakening or if he watches what you do, because truthfully, our belief system is revealed by our most consistent behavior. Whether you like to hear that or not, it's a fact. If you still have trouble behaving in line with the Word of God in some area, the root of the problem is your belief system. If it's been weakened by your experience of contrary circumstance, you should rejoice because this is about the trying of your faith and all you've got to do is let patience have her perfect work. Patience being defined as constancy or consistency in your belief. You're not going to let the contrary circumstance push you off what you believe. Patience also means to cheerfully endure. You don't do this walking on your lower lip. Woe is me. You do it cheerfully knowing that all you have to do is not quit. And eventually you're going to be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now the very next verse, verse 5, says, If any of you lack wisdom, and this is the context that the question is being asked. If you lack wisdom in knowing how to stand in this hard place, if you lack the wisdom of knowing how to, how to act, what to do to, to you know, get the victory in this area, if you lack wisdom, he says, let him ask of me and I'll give it liberally. I'll not upbraid you, but you've got to ask in faith nothing wavering. For the wavering man receives nothing from the Lord. And so this way of pursuing wisdom, asking, is usually associated with not knowing how to get to the ends you believe God has for your life because you're in this hard place. You don't have the money. Your, your health is a challenge. Who knows what your relationships look like? So you ask God for wisdom. How do I function in this place under this pressure that I'm feeling right now? And he'll upbraid you not. He'll give it to you liberally, but you've got to ask in faith. And then we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is still the review. Uh, but we see there that he talks again about these pressure-packed situations. He talks about these occasions of temptation, testing, or trial, always involving adversity. He tempts you by bringing adversity to bear to put pressure on your belief system. And he said, whatever temptation has overtaken you, the first thing you need to know is it's common to man. You're not in the boat by yourself here. There are a lot of other people dealing with the same issues. Sometimes it just does us good to know that there are other people going through the same thing. But the second thing he says is know this, that God isn't going to suffer you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. So he's, he's not going to let it get so bad you can't handle it anymore. And I hear people say all the time in ministry, Pastor, I don't know how much longer I can handle this. Oh, man up or woman up or whatever the right term is. <laughs> he says he's not going to let you suffer more than you're capable of handling. Yeah. And then the third thing he says is you have to know that he always makes a way of escape. There is always a way of escape. 
So the question you ask in verse 5 of James 1, when you're in one of these times of difficulty, is to ask him for wisdom in escaping, overcoming this adversity that you're in at the moment. Hey guys, my name is John Gap, and I am the online engagement pastor here at Living Word. Today we're chatting with some of our Living Word family from the digital church community. They connect with us each and every week on YouTube, Facebook, and the online church platform. Oh, hi Janice. Hi. Boy, this is really good to connect like this. Hi from Canada. Oh, so good to see you all. Uh, Oh, good to see you guys. So I know there's regulars that are on from around the world. Have you guys had the ability to have some conversations with with people oh, from yeah. around the world? Oh, Absolutely. Sure. Ta- Ta- Isa from Fiji. Yeah. yeah. Katsuya yeah. from Italy. Yeah. Elena. Elena, Elena. from Paris. You can count on them to pray for it with you, and you know that they're going to mm-hmm. pray, and they mean it, and they, they stand on the word, and I, I, everybody just seems to support. Do you find that, guys, too? That oh, yeah. Just, Absolutely. We, we've become such an entwined family. You know, it's just like, you know, a divine connection yeah. that's just, um, just so amazing. We have a community who's actually Yes. Mm-hmm. Standing on the word and, and speaking yeah. words of faith and, and encouraging words and not getting into all the fear stuff that yeah the world is into. So for me, that was a huge yeah. piece. And I can say that I have grown spiritually, I mean, tremendously spiritually since joining the online community. Thanks for being part of the vision. Thanks for uh, reaching out into this world and being a, a safe spot for uh, visitors and the online church to uh, come and interact with. Bye. 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 See you. We'll see you guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Understanding is an important thing. And there are 10 things the Bible talks about in the New Testament that he calls mysteries. It's given unto us to know these mysteries. Some of these mysteries he actually says not to be ignorant of. And so we need to have understanding to realize God's fullness and blessing in our life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom doesn't start operating in your life. Not the wisdom of God, not the wisdom you're after, until you are a person who has the fear of the Lord. Now, this isn't a fear of bodily harm or ticking him off and he hammers you in one way or the other. That's not the Lord. Sometimes, you know, we think of him that way. But the fear of the Lord, rightly defined, is reverential awe. And most translations agree in their use of that definition. Reverential awe. You reverence the Lord. What He has meant to your life, who He is, how much He loves you. Having sent Jesus for you, you reverence Him and you let it become awe-inspiring. Because his magnificent and his magnitude and his glory is beyond human comprehension. And you, your awareness of this gives you a reverential awe. But there is a touch of something that is similar to fear when we talk about the fear of the Lord. W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary says this about the fear of the Lord. It is a wholesome sense of dread. Now, those seem like two opposing terms. But he says it's a wholesome sense of dread, not of the Lord, but of the consequences to you of not following his direction. This is the fear of the Lord. I love the definition. 
You can get it out of W.E. Vines. But it is a wholesome dread, not of the Lord, but of the consequences to you if you don't follow his direction. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it leads you to be a doer of the word of God. A lot of people aren't doers of the word. Uh, they are to a degree in the areas where it doesn't trouble them too much or it isn't too difficult. You know, they've taken salvation as being the primary uh, benefit of their salvation when in fact God wants your life to be a change agent in the world you're living now. Salvation should have an effect on your today, not just your eternity. People need to see the goodness of God manifest through your life. They need to see the love of God manifest through your life. They need to see the power of God manifest through your life. So it begins now. It's not just a religious cover your bases in case heaven is real. It's not anything that uh, inappropriate preaching about grace might have implied, which is that it's not really necessary for you to do the Word or to do all of it. Do what you can, but you know, God's grace is sufficient unto you. That's wrong preaching. I mean, God's grace is sufficient to us, but in saying that to Paul, we can see from James chapter 4, the purpose of his grace is to overcome every evil tendency, not to excuse you from the consequence of wrong behavior. God tells you your choices are either going to produce life and blessing or death and cursing. So becoming a doer of the word becomes eminently important. Not the word that's no trouble for you to do, the word in particular that's hard for you to do because it's the areas you don't do the word that most usually are going to open you to the difficulties you're asking God to deliver you from. Most of the time, you get into a hard place. Not all the time. I mean, there, there are times I know people have walked and lived in line with the word the best they can the enemy still brings warfare to them, but very often, and I know this from personal experience, the hardest places of your life come from the doors you open to the enemy of your soul. Doing the Word is your source of protection, your source of blessing and contentment in this life. And don't ever let any influence that would suggest something else operate in you because this is an important consideration, being a doer of the Word. Let me get you to look now. We're, uh, we're going to turn to a verse in So let me ask, I want to answer this question with this next verse. Why do hard places come when I don't obey the word of the Lord? If what you're saying is accurate, and this, that's the word, uh, why do they come? If God isn't hammering me, judging me, if I'm not experiencing the judgment of God or the wrath of God, what is it? Well, it's certainly not either one of those. The Bible tells us that the church is not appointed unto wrath. You will not experience the wrath of God. Under the old covenant, that wasn't the case. And under the, uh, you know, the tribulation to come, it won't be the case. The wrath of God will be poured out, but he makes it clear that the church has not been appointed unto wrath. This is the dispensation of grace, meaning that's how he deals with you, not by wrath and condemnation and judgment. You've not been appointed unto wrath. There is no condemnation in Christ, and your sin has already been judged. The sin you committed yesterday might commit today. 
<clears throat> might commit tomorrow, past, present, or future, it's all been dealt with at the cross of Christ. Forgiveness has already been tendered. Now, there are steps you have to take to, to receive that, that forgiveness. You need to acknowledge wrongdoing, confess it, and say, Lord, your grace is sufficient to overcome every evil tendency. I thank you that I'm not going to be doing this again. Church isn't just Sunday service. Here's some of the ministries that make our church a community. Our youth ministry provides a powerful and engaging worship experience for students grades six through 12 with strong biblical teaching and a great sense of community. I love kids ministry because we have so much fun while also knowing that the word of God is being planted in their hearts. Compass ministry is important because without a special needs ministry, some families are unable to attend church in person. Life Groups provides an opportunity for people to make connections and grow spiritually. The goal of Caring Counseling is to be a resource to our members through the many stages in life. Our desire is to bring in hope and restoration through Jesus Christ. Living free is unique because it takes the power of God's love mixed with powerful recovery principles and brings long lasting sobriety to hurting people. Maranatha is our pre-K through 12th grade Christian school that provides your children a nationally recognized college preparatory education right here at our Brooklyn Park campus. There's so many things I love about our Northwest campus, but it's truly the presence of God from the worship to the message to the community that's been cultivated. It's home to me and so many others in the Rogers area. La Iglesia Española es un lugar para toda la familia donde podrás disfrutar una experiencia y conocer a Dios más íntimamente. Outreach is literally reaching out beyond the four walls of the church, whether that be here in our community locally by helping elementary schools with backpacks, helping families have Thanksgiving meals through baskets of blessing, helping children get toys for Christmas through Share Christmas, or helping our medical community by providing meals for them. There's so many ways that we help our community, but we also reach out internationally and we help other countries and orphanages and ministries from all of us at Living Word, thank you for being a part of this ministry. Before we go, I want to let you know that we are expanding our ministry in exciting ways including the goal of launching five new churches worldwide this year. I'd love for you to be a part. Just visit our website for all the details you'll need. Thank you for joining us today. Tune in again soon, and until then, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.